Breaking a rail car is a matter of how safely it can stop in a short distance. In order to take energy from a running train, the kinetic energy of the train must be converted to heat and released into the atmosphere. Initially, friction brakes were mainly used to stop a wheel or brake disc by pressing the brake shoe against it and converting it into frictional heat. In principle, this method involves wear of the wheel and the brake shoe, and the heat generated by friction reduces the coefficient of friction, resulting in a loss of braking force. Furthermore, the heat can loosen the wheel tires and cause them to come off. At the Ataya Pass in the early days of DC electrification, trains stopped for long periods of time in the middle of a downhill grade to cool the brakes, and emergency measures were even taken, such as pouring water on the wheels to cool them. Disc brakes do not cause tire loosening, but they still put the brake disc at risk of damage. As electric vehicles progressed, a method emerged that used the motor as a generator to capture the kinetic energy of the train by generating electricity. The converted electricity was initially passed through a resistor that converted it into heat and released it into the atmosphere, but this was wasteful, so various efforts were made to reuse this electricity. At Ataya Pass, DC power regeneration was realized at an early stage, and since the number of trains in operation was small and could not depend on the power consumption of other trains, inverters with mercury rectifiers were installed at the substation and returned to the main power system. Of course, even if electricity is regenerated, the electricity is converted to heat at the reutilization site and eventually released into the atmosphere. Electric brakes have greatly reduced the wear on the brake cages. In particular, with the advent of AC trains that use AC motors such as induction motors, there is almost no wear on the brakes, which is close to the ideal situation for brakes. One such brake that does not rely on friction between the wheel and the brake shoes is called a dynamic brake. It means a dynamic braking device and is a generic term for brakes with a structure that generates braking force when the wheels are in motion. Because brake force is dependent on wheel rotation, braking force is reduced at low speeds and cannot be used for stop braking, but in some respects this provides a significant advantage. Since braking force is automatically reduced when wheel speed is reduced, this reduces slippage, or slipping, caused by over braking or reduced friction due to dampness of the rail surface. Slipping is an abhorrent phenomenon to crew members because it causes a sudden decrease in frictional force and extremely poor braking, which creates flat abrasions on the wheels, called flats, and shortens the replacement life of the wheels. This dynamic braking was actively utilized in electric vehicles, where the motor is directly used as a generator. However, steam and internal combustion locomotives cannot use this electric brake unless they use an electric drive. This was not a problem in the days of low-speed trains, but as train speeds increased, the time and expense required to maintain brake equipment became more and more expensive, and countermeasures were required. Engine brakes have long been used as a method that does not rely on ordinary friction brakes. By transferring the kinetic energy of the train to the engine, the engine is forced to turn from the wheel side, and the resistance created by this process is used as a brake. Friction as the piston moves in the cylinder is also used, but in a relatively small proportion, and most of the resistance is from the air being compressed in the cylinder. Air sucked into the engine is compressed by the pistons and gets hotter, and when it is released it tries to return to its original temperature, but overall it gets hotter because of the resistance of the intake and exhaust systems. Thus, the train's kinetic energy is converted to heat and reduced, and its speed is reduced. Except for resistance-controlled electric vehicles, special resistors must be installed for this heat treatment, but internal combustion vehicles can use the cooling system of the drive, so no additional new equipment is required. In reciprocating steam engines, if you want to use the engine brake, you can do so at will by operating the reversing gear. As DMH-17 engines became more popular and were deployed on grade lines and high-speed trains, the utilization of engine braking became a challenge. 
If the engine is notched off with the direct connection, the engine is connected to the wheels with the fuel supply at idle operation and acts as a brake because the force from the wheels to turn the engine is greater than the rotational force at idle. However, the effect is not as great as it would have been with a 400 horsepower engine in a body weighing around 40 tons. Moreover, braking force is strongest at the highest speed and decreases linearly as the speed slows down. Its acceleration is around 20 kg partons near its maximum speed, and it does not even obtain a deceleration of 1 km per hour per second. When viewed as a downhill grade holding brake, the balancing speed on a 25 par mil downhill grade would be 100 km per hour, and on a mountainous route with many curves, the reliance on friction brakes is significant. Since this is the case with two-engine cars, it is even weaker in a mixed formation of one-engine cars. Therefore, it was decided to stop supplying fuel to the engine and modify the engine to run purely on power from the wheels. Since the control circuit of a conventional vehicle cannot maintain a direct connection when the engine is stopped, a circuit was added to avoid this problem. This increased the braking force to a little over 25 kg per ton near maximum speed. However, this value is weak, not even obtaining a deceleration of 1 km per hour per second. When viewed as a downhill grade holding brake, the balancing speed on a 25 par mil downhill grade is 85 km per hour. The use of friction brakes is still unavoidable on mountain routes. Although the effect was not as good as it could have been, the advantage was that it did not add much load to the engine or clutch, and it reduced the wear on the brakes. Moreover, the cost of modification was less than 100,000 yen, so it could be added to conventional vehicles at a fraction of the cost, and it was used in many places. To obtain stronger braking force, the exhaust port could be covered, but this was not considered at the time due to the increased load on the engine and the somewhat cumbersome modifications required. However, because JNR Shikoku General Bureau operated a large number of diesel trains on gradient lines, expectations for exhaust brakes were high, and although a prototype was tested at the Tadatsu Works and proved effective, it was not adopted on a full-scale basis. On the other hand, the use of engine brakes on new diesel trains was considered from the beginning. The system is the same as DMH-17, and although it does not employ an exhaust brake, it utilizes a single-stage three-element converter that can be used up to high speeds, allowing the engine brake to be used not only in the directly connected stage, but also in the hydraulic converter stage. In the 181 series, the engine brake can be enabled by operating the master controller handle, and by shifting it to the left in the notch-off position, the engine brake notch is activated. By advancing the handle one notch forward, the engine brake is activated, at which time the engine is supplied with idle fuel, by advancing it to second notch, the fuel supply is deactivated, and by advancing it to third notch, the hydraulic converter is filled with oil and the converter brake is activated. This figure shows the energy that can be absorbed at each notch as a function of speed and horsepower. As with DMH-17, the effect is not so great for the first and second notches that use a direct connection, but it is quite effective for the third notch that uses a converter. With a direct drive stage, the pump and output sides of the hydraulic converter can be connected to the engine and wheels as one unit, and energy can be absorbed from these two turbines. Moreover, the fixed guide blades inside the transmission, which provide resistance to these turbines, are stationary and in the least efficient state for a hydraulic converter. This means that it can be used in the most effective state in terms of converting all kinetic energy into heat. The heat dissipation device can use the original radiator for the drive, so it does not affect the weight of the vehicle. Hydraulic converter brakes, which have many advantages, were not used in diesel locomotives of the time. In a locomotive hauled train, if the dynamic brakes alone were to provide braking for the entire train formation, the locomotive would have to carry all of the braking power. The energy that must be absorbed by the locomotive brakes is 1910 horsepower to maintain a speed of 50 km per hour for a 400-ton freight train going down 25 par mils.
If the speed is 55 km per hour at 600 tons, the energy that must be absorbed is 2,260 horsepower. If the speed is 65 km per hour at 1,000 tons, it is 1,350 horsepower, which often requires braking power beyond the locomotive's output. Moreover, the problem with hydraulic diesel locomotives is that they do not have a direct drive mechanism. Therefore, only the output turbine can be used to absorb power, and it cannot meet the required performance. The hydraulic converter for DE50, DW7, was designed to eliminate this disadvantage. By adding a brake-specific fluid coupling, powerful dynamic braking was obtained. Fluid couplings are simple and lightweight in structure, and can be turned on and off as well as adjusted for braking force by moving oil in and out of the converter. The oil cooling system for hydraulic converters can be used, and since it is compact and lightweight, it can be installed according to the required performance without much concern for weight. Brakes with fluid couplings have long been used in heavy-duty trucks, and there was little concern about the adoption of a new technology. DW7 is equipped with a fluid coupling that has an absorption capacity of 1,440 horsepower, which is equivalent to the driving wheel output of the locomotive. It had a 7-notch brake control stage, and the absolute value of the brake force roughly matched the acceleration force and grade balancing speed when hauling a train. During braking, the engine is idle, but this means that the cooling fan speed is low and cannot radiate the large amount of heat that is delivered from the fluid coupling to the cooling water system. Therefore, when dynamic braking was applied with the DE50, the engine had to be operated at high RPM. In addition, to ensure that the cooling capacity of the radiator was not exceeded, the brake force could be limited automatically according to the speed of the vehicle, independent of the brake notch. Thus, JNR's internal combustion vehicles, which had advanced to the stage of fully utilizing dynamic brakes, reached their peak in the 1970s, and no significant development occurred thereafter. The use of fluid couplings for retardation brakes was once considered for use on two-shaft gas turbine vehicles, where engine brakes do not work, but the gas turbine vehicles themselves disappeared. In locomotives, even the subsequent development of new rolling stock would cease. After a long period of stagnation, the JNR organization itself was forced to undergo a fundamental structural reform through privatization, ushering in a new era. The diesel train is equipped with a full-scale exhaust brake and demonstrates noisy, yet powerful braking. The locomotives parted ways with the hydraulic converter, and with the advent of the DF200 with diesel-electric power transmission, electric brakes were adopted, and dynamic brakes were once again utilized.